Good morning, happy Sabbath, and welcome to Mount Zion Seventh-day Adventist Church. We also want to welcome our, Emma our Emmanuel family and all those of you who have tuned in to uh, review our Sabbath school lesson with us. Again, we hope you had, had a happy and safe holiday and you've enjoyed your Christmas uh, gathering. We know with this COVID virus, it's not easy, but with the Lord's help, everything will be well. Again, our, our Sabbath school lesson is entitled Heaven, Education, and Eternal Learning. And this morning, we have for you a very, very special guest who will be doing our Sabbath school lesson for you and for everyone who have tuned in to hear and to review this lesson with us. We have Pastor Nevalon Meadows. Thank he you, will sir. be doing the lesson, and we want you to welcome him with your prayers and a hearty amen. Good morning, saints of God. Good morning for all of God's people. Would you pray with me? Our Father and our God, we thank you for this morning. We ask that you would bless us, that you would instruct, and that you would convince our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. This morning's subject, as we close out the year, as we end this quarter, education, but the education that we're looking at is education while in heaven. Eternal learning, eternal learning while we are in heaven. If you would, please, education. If education could speak, if education could personify anything, education would tell you this. Learn the best recommendation that education can make is to learn something. As we look at our lesson, I just want to put a thought in front of you. There are two things that most people want. They either want to be the same or either they want to be different. To want to be the same is to want what everyone else has. To want to be the different is not to want what everyone else has. Is a thought. Is knowledge information? Is knowledge power or is information power? When we look at John 3.16 as outlined in our Sabbath school lesson, I want you to give it some thought. When you look at John 3.16 and you compare John 3.16 with Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, ask yourself, where is the authority of the plan of salvation. It is the issue clear? As the Sabbath school lesson points out to read John 3.16, I just thought I'd ask you, what is the difference between the two? Well, John 3.16 tells you that, that you can be saved. In other words, John 3.16 tells you that there's an opportunity to be saved. And the difference with that and Ephesians 2 is Ephesians 2 tells you how to be saved. So when we look at this lesson and we look at John 3, 16, let's look at it in comparison always with Ephesians chapter 2. As outlined in our Sabbath school lesson, the memory text, we'll come to that in a moment, the memory text, but is also given to us 1 John 5. And this is how it reads. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye believe on the name of the Son of God. Now, I know that when you reviewed this lesson, you asked the same question that I asked. Why is this repeated twice in this pericope of First John? And I begin to take thought, and I said, hopefully you have done the same, that, that God is emphasizing this because he wants believers to persevere. And by repeating it, he's encouraging us to persevere. The evidence of religion, do the advantage of faith of believers is 
to encourage them to persevere. So as you look over John 3.16, as outlined in our Sabbath afternoon study, and as you look at 1 John 5, there are some points there that maybe we ought to consider. And I want you to consider in this context, is this information power? Is this knowledge power? And then ask this thought. And if we're having a discussion, you'll consider, what is the difference between knowledge and information? Are both of them equally power? If we get some time at the conclusion of this study, we'll answer that question for you. Also was outlined in our lesson, 1 Timothy 1 and verse 16. How be it for this cause, for this cause, I obtain mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern, a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to everlasting. How be it for this cause? What cause? The cause that the, the writer, the author is asking us to look at that that in me. He says, how be it for this cause? I obtain mercy that in me. This cause, the cause that I'm taking up, the cause that I'm considering, the fact that I believe, that's my cause. I'm taking up this cause. It's a part of what I'm thinking. It's a part of what I'm saying. It's a part of how I'm living. I'm taking up this cause. And because, as the author emphasizes, because we're taking up this cause, then there, I obtain mercy. And that is, it's in me. Why? Because I believe. And because I believe, I obtain mercy. Because in me, I believe. In other words, there must be a demonstration of belief. So, if we could summarize that with six words, I'd give you these six. What I think, I say. What I say, I do. And what I do over and over and over again becomes a habit, and habit formulates my character, and character determines my destiny, to be or, yes, not to be. So for this pattern, this, this, I'm given mercy, and, and if we had time, we would outline that there's a difference between mercy and grace. There's a difference. And the issue around mercy is that I'm given this because I'm demonstrating a pattern. And even though I'm struggling and, and I have success or I'm struggling and, and I might fail, I'm demonstrating, Lord, it is my intention is to create a pattern. Therefore, this mercy is something that I'm awarded. So 1 Corinthians 13, as outlined in our Sabbath afternoon portion of the study. For now, we see through a glass darkly. But then, face to face. Now I know in part there are some things that, that, that I do not know and, and, I, and I do not understand and, and I can't get a clear answer until then. For example, you tell me, how does God, who is everywhere at the same time, applies an umbilical cord to omnipresence? You tell me. And these are questions that we will ask and answers that will be given. So it said, but now I know in part, but then shall I know even also. This is in addition. In addition to me having my questions answered, in addition to that, I will be known and you will know me and I will know you and we will be able to identify one another. Yes, we'll be in a glorified body, but you still be able to identify little Nab. They call me Nab when I was 10 years old. Nab, is that you? Yes. Sabbath afternoon. Zechariah 13. And one shall say unto him, what are these wounds in thine hands? Then he shall answer those with which I was wounded in the house of my friend. Now, I'm not able right now at this moment to jump to where I want to go because I, I want to process 
this lesson as outlined. But I just want you to put this in the back of your mind. It says, I, 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 those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. Mind you, and, and you got John 14, and it, said, and it says, and it says, be ye not troubled. And, and it says, and God has a place for you. And he says, and I go, and if I go. Now just hold that thought there because I want you to get, when we get to that thought, I want you to apply it to the house of my friends. And he says, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, well, wait a minute. Didn't he go? Why does he say if? Hold that thought and take it back around the corner and apply it to my friends when we get there. So the memory text, we're just starting, saints of God, we're just starting. The memory text, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who what? I hear you, who love them. So, I want to jump to Friday and then come back to Sunday. Because we rarely get to look at Friday. There is something astonishing here on Friday's lesson. And it is the great controversy, page 662 to 678. But I just want to look at one page, 665. And if you have studied this lesson, just this lesson to end the quarter, if you have put any amount of serious intelligent application to this lesson and you have looked at great controversy, page 665, I want you to consider what has been said because this that is written there has never been said by anyone else on this planet. Take a look at it with me. First, imagine some picture that was never created. And then consider this, and all of this I'm going to take from Friday's lesson. God has a throne, and that throne is alive. It's a living, thriving, moving entity who layeth, Psalms 104th Division, who layeth the beams of his chambers in the waters, who maketh the clouds his chariots, who walketh upon the wings. He walks upon the wings of the wind. How? Who maketh his angels spirits, his ministers a flaming fire. So whenever the Bible is speaking about God moving in wings all about him, we're talking about even the chariot. Yes, and we're talking about the presence as we go to the 68th division of Psalms. The chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. The Lord is among them. God's throne is a living, throbbing, moving throne. Now, all of this, I want you to know, comes from Great Controversy 665. And, and sometimes we don't get to Friday. But I just want to just jump ahead just a little bit further and add this to it, if you don't mind. Revelation 7. And all the angels, how many? All, excluding, talking about right now, excluding those of Matthew 18 who are assigned to us. All the angels stood round about the throne, and there comes a time when all will get there exactly after the second coming. But And all the angels stood round about the throne. So that means about the throne, all the angels. But look also, and about the the elders, and the four beasts. Now, if you're looking at this with me from Revelation 7, then you've got to see that in the center are the 24 elders, and in the center are these four beasts that Ezekiel describes as angels that have wings, angels that can go in any direction without turning. Come on, walk with me. Come on. 
And, and so if you imagine with me, according to what's outlined in Revelation 7, uh, in the middle of the throne, uh, as, they, there are the 24 elders, and in the middle of the throne, uh, there are the four beasts, which are four angels, and about them are all the angels. Do you see it yet? If not, let's add a little more color to it. Great controversy, 6-5. Six, six, Nearest the throne are those who were once zealous in the cause of Satan. You see, alcoholics, crackheads, dope fiends, unwanted, undesired people, even desiring to come in and worship with you, even those who seek to be baptized, and you still look at them as being zealous in the cause of Satan. You can't come in here like that. You can't wear that in this place. Nearest the throne are those who were once zealous in the cause of Satan, but who plucked as brands from the burning has followed their savior with deep, intense devotion. The next group are those who perfected Christian character in the midst of falsehood and infidelity. Those who honored the law of God when the Christian world declared it void. And millions, you're talking about a pandemic, you're talking about the threat of a Sunday law, and millions of all angels who were martyred to their faith. And beyond that group is the great multitude which no man could number of all nation, kindred, tongues, and people. Before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. So, Revelation 7 says, in the center, there, and how do you know it's center? Because it says, about the throne. That means around the throne. About the elders. That means around the elders. So the throne and the elders and the four angels are in the center. A little more clarity there. And this is a picture you might, as an architect, want to develop. God's throne is a living, thriving throne. And then you have the six elders, 24 elders, six on each side. And then when, the, when they get there, you have the 144,000, 36,000 on each side. Then you have the number that no man could number. Now, mind you this, mind you this, that God's throne is a living thriving, breathing, moving entity. Why are these levels of contact necessary? Remember, Jesus is fully God and fully man. Amen? And since he's fully man, he chooses to be in one place at one time. So while he's in heaven, when he's in heaven, he's only going to be in one place at one time. Heaven has gates, three gates in the east, north, south, and west, and you have 12 gates, and each gate is a solid pearl. And there's a river running through it talking about heaven. So back to this port, part or portion of the Sabbath school lesson. Here are, is a discourse from Jesus on himself. Talking about the fate of the dead. All right? Our fathers did eat manna in the desert, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth light unto the world. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. He that believeth on me shall never thirst. This discourse continues. And sometimes when you review other denominational teachings, you'll find that they teach whenever you take the communion service, 
you are literally drinking the blood of Jesus. And some denominations teach that whenever you take the bread in the communion service, you are literally eating of the flesh of Jesus. Now, every time that denomination has communion, that's what they tell their people. And you know what that means? That means that Jesus has to die every time they have communion. So this is not to be taken literal. This is spiritual discourse from Jesus on himself. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life. And I will raise him up at the last day, for my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. There is a spiritual application and not a literal one. Faith of the dead. There are only four groups of people on this planet. It's amazing how the devil has convinced us that there are multitudes of ethnicities that are important. There's only four groups of people that's important to God on this planet. Just four. And they're not outlined by where they live. They're not outlined by where they born. They're not outlined by their blood lineage. They're outlined by their relationship to Jesus Christ. Just four. And when this Sabbath school lesson pointed this out, I couldn't help but remember 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We're still talking about the fate of the dead. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead, come on now, see, that's, that's, that's one group, the dead in Christ. There's only four groups. If we're talking about the fate of the dead in this Sabbath school lesson, then we're talking about two groups. But, did I go for, okay. And so, it says, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, and then we which are alive and remain. Let's look over at Revelation 6. And they said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne. At the appearance of Jesus Christ, the wicked that are alive are asked for their life to be taken that the rocks would fall on them. So here are the four groups. You have the dead righteous, you have the living righteous. You have the living wicked. And at the second coming, they ask for their lives to be taken because they cannot stand in the presence of the wrath of the Lamb. And the fourth group are the dead wicked. The dead wicked at the second coming are not brought back to life. They remain dead. So you should ask yourself, when will every eye see him? When will every knee bow? Especially when the dead wicked are not brought to life at the second coming. Looking at this Sabbath school lesson, it seems to remind me of so many things. And it said, God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Now, keep that in mind. Everything in the past that has value and desire and connection to the past will be destroyed. That's what also the pillar of salt, Lot's wife, looking back, is making reference to the past. Everyone that still wants to connect to the past, see value in the past, have desire for the past, shall be washed or wiped away as well. But in the Sabbath school lesson, someone makes this statement or question, eternal life? Wow. Who wants eternal life when they're 70 years old? Who wants eternal life when they're 80 years old? Let me tell you, down here on earth, 70 is the new 50. Ask me. <laughs> I'll enjoy that one by myself. Down here, 80 is the new 60. 
Can you imagine what 70 would be with eternal life? It's like living for a minute. Lord have mercy. <laughs> so, let's move on a little further. But it says, the heavens, that's plural. That should have gotten your attention too. The heavens shall pass away. Verse 13, and nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for the new heavens. How many heavens are there? There is a non-Christian denomination that teaches there are seven heavens. How many heavens do you teach there are? How many heavens does the Bible instruct that exists? How many heavens are there? Well, one heaven is where the birds fly. The second heaven, where the sun, moon, and stars are. The birds can't fly near the sun, moon, and stars. And the third heaven is where God's throne is. The Bible expounds and speaks to these three heavens. I have not found any more beyond three. So it says in the new heavens, and, and a, there'll be, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth was passed away. In verse 2, and a holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God, where? Out of heaven. And, and it's often described as a city four square. It's often described as a city that has three gates in the east, three gates in the west, three gates in the north, and three gates in the south. And the three gates, each gate is a solid pearl. The new Jerusalem coming down from heaven, adorned. So there's so many pictures you can get that authors cannot capture. Adorned as a bride. A new heaven, four square, three gates, and it has 12 foundations. 12 foundations. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. And he said unto me, It is done. When you hear that, it is done. You should ask yourself this question. What is the difference between it is done and it is finished? Heaven is a school. It's a field of study. The universe, its, it's teacher, the infinite one, a, a branch of this school was established in Eden and the plan of redemption accomplished Education will again be taken up in Eden's school. For now we see through a glass darkly. I know in part, but then I shall know. 1 Corinthians 4. Therefore, judge nothing before it's time. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm living in, and I'm interacting with a new mindset. And oftentimes, it's young people that say, you can't judge me. See, older folk understand, but the younger folk, you, you can't, don't judge, you can't judge me. And folk back up and say, no, I can't. But the Bible says, yes, you can. And you need to learn the authority of judging because it says judge nothing before it's time. It doesn't say don't judge, just don't judge before it's time. And what are you talking about, Mr. Teacher? Well, by their fruits, you know them. That's judgment. But you can never say to anyone, the route you're taking, you're going to hell. You can't say that to anyone. The route you're taking, you're going to heaven. You cannot say that to anyone because you don't know. So do not judge anything before it's time. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but are the things which are not seen. For the things which are not seen are temporal, but the things which 
excuse me, the things that are seen are temporal. The things that are not seen are eternal. It's like an argument or an explanation. It's looking for an explanation between the difference of hope and faith. We don't have too much time to go and to look at that, but I'm asking you to take note. Uh, and it says, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 17 to 19. I, I highlighted 19 because there is no verse 19. What hope do these texts offer us? And hope only means as much to you as you understand what hope is. And hope and faith are not the same thing. Hope is favorable expectation. Things look good. Hope has to handle the facts. Hope has to look at the material. Hope has to interact with those things to confirm. Well, it's favorable. Hope is favorable expectation. Faith, firm conviction. For faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. See, hope, if there's a door, and God says go through the door, hope has to see the portal. Hope has to see the hinges. Hope has to acknowledge that there's a doorknob. Hope may even have to see others walk through the door. But, but, but hope says, oh, that's favorable expectation. Afterwards, uh, uh, others have gone through that door. Others have handled the handle. Others have swung the hinges. But faith, when God says go through the door, faith would walk through a wall. I don't see a door, but I know that God will make a way. So what, do, what hope do these texts offer for us? What might some of these unseen eternal things be that, are, that we are waiting for, that we are promised through Jesus Christ? Well, one thing about the promises, Great Controversy 6.21 says the power is in the promises. The power is in the promises. And though we don't have too much time to go look through hope, if there's ever something that is contextual for hope and faith, are the promises. For God's promise is God's presence, and God's presence is God's power. If you want his power, you got to have his presence. And if you want his presence, you got to claim the promise. I believe it's great controversy, page 621, and even verse chapter, uh, uh, page 620. It says, uh, now, while Christ is in the most holy place, we should seek to become perfect, but it, just before that, it also says that we should become familiar with God by proving his promises. In other words, we don't know him unless we can prove his promises. Revelation 2, he that hath an ear, let him hear. Let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. 
To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. On Wednesday, it also outlines that there will be students of science, if you follow along with me in the red, those who have interest in the music and the, and the nature of voices, those who are interested in detecting, the, understanding the notes and, and that they're not wailing, but they're the un, neither are they the undertone of sorrow. But when you have a time, an opportunity to study music and the voice in heaven, it is written in, in education, page 303, God's name you'll find is written large and not in earth or sea or sky, one sign of ill remaining. His name will replace every, every situation of sin. Where there was sin, where there was error, where there was misinformation, where there was a lie, you'll find God's name written, the signature renewed. Zechariah 13, 6, and one shall say unto him, what are these wounds in thine hand? Then he shall answer, those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. What do you think this text means? I'm putting it out there, and we're coming to it. The more men learn of God, the greater will be their admiration of his character. The great controversy is ended. I'd like to ask you, at least have you to think, how did the great controversy begin? And what is the great controversy? The great controversy is ended and sin and sinners are no more. The entire universe is clean. And there's one pulse of harmony and gladness that beats through creation. And it says, and the lion Again, on Friday, as we move towards conclusion, the lion, we, the, the lion we should much dread and fear will then lie down with the lamb. And everything in the new earth will be peace and harmony. Now, the lion laying down with the lamb. Some of us throughout our years have applied this to children leading adults. Every time we see a child in front of adults quoting scripture or even preaching, teaching, a little child shall lead them. That's not what Isaiah 11 and verse 6 is talking about. And a little child shall lead them. We're talking about the wild beasts in the new earth. It's not talking about children leading adults. It is not the responsibility of children to lead adults. So when it speaks in Isaiah 11 and verse 6, it's talking about grabbing even the lion by his mane and dragging him through, leading and pulling and playing on his tail and him enjoying it as if the child is the master. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many what? And if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go. I don't know if you ever stopped when you read this. Well, wait a minute. He did go. Why does he say, and if I go? So, so remember that question is there, and, and what are the wounds in thy hand? He said, these are the wounds that I, re I receive for, from the house of my friends or from relationship with my friends. So what is he saying here? And if I go, well, if you're making note, make note of this. Jesus went to prepare a place 
for anyone. But he didn't go to prepare a place for everyone. Come on, cogitate. See, everybody is not going to accept him, but anybody can. And the anybody are those who are his friends. So I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go for you, and if I go for you, then these wounds in my hand are for you. For you, my friend. And the question is asked, what are these wounds? In thy hand. He said, these are wounds that I received from the house of my friends. We have some questions or points for discussion. For those of you who are viewing from the Mount Zion Seventh-day Adventist Church, and those of you who are viewing from the sister church, Emmanuel, these questions, if you have them, I'm asking that you send them in to the church. The church would forward them to me, and I will answer these questions or questions that you have, whether they are questions for clarity or questions just out of concern or questions that have come from the list as the Q&A closes this lesson. I challenge you to two things as we close. Stay on your toes and keep your knees dirty. I challenge you to two things, just two things. Stay on your toes, be alert, but keep your knees dirty. Pray. And prayer is just such a powerful, wonderful thing. We want to talk about it in our session this morning. We're going to have a dialogue with the word of God. We're going to have a worship experience, one that follows this immediately. So you hold on, don't move. And we want to look at the concern. Where is Jesus now? What is he doing now? What are the questions that as Christians we should be asking what answers should we be given? What should we be studying now? Immediately following this Sabbath school discourse, we'll be moving into a worship service, same place, same location. Just stand by. And may God bless you. And may God give you what you need. Father, fix us. Save us from sin. Save us from Satan and save us from ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen. Jinsi, Sabine, and Remya are students at Katarakara Seventh day Adventist School in southern India. At the end of the 10th grade, students who want to continue their studies must take a government administered exam. They get admission for colleges based on the result, and therefore it is very crucial, very determinant for their future life. One cannot think of not attempting that examination if they want to pursue their study further. The government exam date was on Sabbath, and the principal worked hard to get an alternate date, but they were not able to change it. The principal went to court on behalf of the three students, and finally, the judge agreed that they could take the exams after the Sabbath hours. The night of the test, they should have been tired, but they felt refreshed as they completed the exams. Nice to write the exam after Sabbath and also, uh, and also praise the God for giving this opportunity to write this exam after Sabbath. And we got a nice mark, a nice and good mark to, um, for that exam. When the exam results were issued, 
the three faithful students learned that they had scored higher than the other students who had taken the exam earlier in the day. After the exam, the media descended on the Adventist school campus. Newspaper and from the TV channel, everywhere people flooded in. And they asked me, what's this? The whole public, the entire public came to know about Sabbath. What is Sabbath and why they keep Sabbath? Because of your financial support of the World Budget Admission Offerings, a new classroom block will be constructed on the Katarakara campus. The new building will bring 20 new classrooms and allow the school to be accredited by a non-governmental council that will not administer the tests on the Sabbath. Thank you for your support of the mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. To find out more, please visit AdventistMission.org.
Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. We are so glad to be here to worship the Lord on the last Sabbath of the year. 2020 is about to be coming to a close, and we are getting ready to head into 2021. So we should finish off this year by giving God the best praise that we can. So let's start off with singing, Oh, come, let us adore him. For a second, I was in New York or Chicago. Real nice and nice and cool. But thank God, He's brought us through another Christmas season, and we pray as we embark or start to head towards 2021, God will continue to keep His people, and that we will continue to give um, worship and praise to His most holy name. Just want to say welcome to our first of all our Emmanuel Church family. I want to say hello to our Mount Zion Church family and anyone else who might be watching online. We just wish you a season's greetings. I know 
this year is a little bit different because we were all hunkered down just with our families. Uh, my, my Christmas was um, Zoom calls for my family and my wife's family. And, you know, actually it, it was probably better because we got to see people that we might not have seen otherwise. So again, we just want to welcome you on this Sabbath, the last Sabbath of 2020. And I know lots of us are glad to be rid of 2020. But just hold on. You know, as usually things get a little bit worse, but God will keep his people. And, and I read something this week that says, despite whatever is happening, one thing that we know for sure is that the gospel will be preached. So nothing will hinder God's gospel. So we just need to hold on to God's ever, never changing hand. We want to say hello to our pastor and his family who are off on vacation. We, we pray that you're enjoying your rest and that you'll come back all nice and refreshed next week and ready to go and ready to hit the road running because we're already here at Mount Zion to hit the road running. Again, welcome and we pray that as we worship God today, that you'll be truly blessed. This time we're going to have our children's story and kids, you know the drill. Just um, come, be come in front of your TVs and your telephones and watch the children's story. Fishnet Bible Stories proudly presents The First Christmas. Nazareth was a little town where a girl named Mary could be found. Mary loved God and she loved to pray. Then something amazing happened one day. The angel Gabriel came to Mary and told her she was chosen. Mary, you will have a special baby. He will be God's gift to the world. Mary answered, But I have no husband. How can this happen? Gabriel said, Your baby will be the Son of God. He will save the people from their sin and bring the world back to God again. Mary said, The mother of the Son of God I will be. Let it happen as you say. I love God and I will obey. In Nazareth, this little town, a man called Joseph could be found. The angel Gabriel visited Joseph and called him by name. Joseph! Mary will have a baby, the Son of God, a little boy. His name must be Jesus, and he will bring you so much joy. God knows you love Mary, so make her your wife. Be a good father to Jesus all of your life. When it was time for Jesus' birth, there was so much that had to be done. Everyone had to register and travel to their hometown. To Bethlehem, Joseph and Mary must go. Joseph packed the donkey and carried Mary in tow. That night they reached Bethlehem, but there were no rooms to be found. The baby was coming. Mary and Joseph needed a place to be safe and sound. So Joseph and Mary stayed with the animals, all clean and toasty and warm. In that lowly manger, the sweet baby Jesus was born. Angels filled the sky over the hills. The shepherds were terrified and stood very still. Go find the baby that was born this night. He will bring the world goodness and light. Glory to God in the highest. The angels did sing. Peace on earth, good will to all men. That's what God brings. The shepherds ran down from the hills. They saw baby Jesus and stood very still. They worshiped and bowed down and told everyone in town, good will and peace on earth is what God brings. Born this day is God's son, the newborn king. In the sky appeared a bright star seen by the wise men who lived very far. The meaning of this special star was clear. The newborn king has arrived. He is here. They packed up their riches and camels and traveled. At King Herod's castle, they searched for the newborn king because they had precious gifts to bring. 
but they were told to go to Bethlehem. The wise men left Herod's and they followed the star. The mother and child weren't very far. They found him in Bethlehem as they were told and gave him gifts of myrrh, frankincense, and gold. In their sleep that night, the wise men did dream. An angel told them not to tell Herod where they have been. Herod was jealous and wanted to kill the babe. Go home another way and do not delay. When King Herod did not hear from the wise men, he realized that they had run away. He called his soldiers to kill all the babies without delay. But the angel spoke to Joseph in his sleep at night. He said, Do not be in a fright. You must take the baby and his mother and run. The king's soldiers are about to come. God will keep you safe and sound. Stay in Egypt until Herod's no longer around. To Egypt, Joseph and Mary and Jesus must go. Joseph packed the camel with Mary and Jesus in tow. God would keep his promise to save the world from their sin. Jesus would bring people back to God again. Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this story, please help us out by clicking subscribe and check out our other videos. Merry Christmas! Good morning once again. It is now time for our call to worship. And as usual, we will repeat the fourth commandment. Exodus 8, 20, verses 8 through 12, 8 through 11, sorry. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days... The Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested on the seventh day. Wherefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we come in the name of Jesus. We come asking that we would acknowledge your presence and that collectively, Lord, we will continue to receive and invite you. We ask that as we move through this service that what we say, what we do, and And how we approach you become acceptable to one another such that we agree. And that we become one and that the outpouring of thy power, the outpouring of your spirit would be in every song, would be in every part of the sermon. Yes, Lord, would be in every part of the service. In Jesus' name we pray. Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. All right, online, I hope you said happy Sabbath back. That's that's the polite thing to do. You know, it is very cold outside and even a little bit inside. Um, And when you are cold at home, I don't know if you're like me, but it's hard to get out of bed. It is the hardest thing to get out of bed. But once you get up and you get going, it gets a little bit easier, right? Um, So I have a feeling this morning that, you know, just like with exercise, it heats you up a little bit. Your worship may be able to warm something up both physically, but then also spiritually this morning. So it's no better way to end this year than to say, Lord, you are good and your mercies endureth forever. 2020 has been a year, but our God is greater. Can you say that this morning? Has he been good? Has he been great to anyone? 
All right, this morning, let's worship. Let's sing, Lord, you are good. We invite you to put your hands together. Make a joyful noise to the Lord this morning. For he is worthy of them all. All the glory, all the honor, and the praise. Lord, you are good and your mercy endures forever. Lord, you are good and your mercy endures forever. Let's do that again. Lord, you are good. Lord, you are good and your mercy endures forever. Lord, you are good and your mercy endures forever.
You are God alone. You are God alone. From the before time began. approach God's throne of grace where mercy and grace is dispensed. He tells us, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I 
will give you rest. Cast all your cares upon me, for I care for you. And he promises with these words, he that cometh unto me, I will in no wise cast out. Brothers and sisters from the Emmanuel Church, Mount Zion, all those of you who are look, tuned in to be with us on this God's holy Sabbath day, we invite you to bow your heads. Those of you who can stand or, 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 or kneel or whatever, we approach a God who is unlike any other. So let's reverently approach God's throne of grace as we seek his mercies. Loving and gracious Father, we, your children, come before your throne of grace in the name of Jesus to worship you, to praise you, and to thank you for your goodness, your mercy, and your grace. Lord, there is none like you. You are our creator and our sustain. And Lord, you showed our love to us in that while we were yet sinners, you sent your son Jesus to die in our place to save us from sin and death. And Lord, we give you all the honor, all the praise, and all the glory. And our Father, we are asking that you will wash us in the blood of Jesus. Clean our hands, purify our hearts and our thoughts, so that everything we do or say will be to bring honor and glory to your holy name. Lord, we are so thankful that amid this pandemic, you have kept us. You are a faithful God who, who promised to never leave us nor forsake us. You promised us, Lord, that you would protect us and none of these things, if we are faithful to you, none of these pandemics, these plagues will come nigh our dwelling. And Lord, we trust you. We believe in faith, Lord, that you are God who can never fail. So strengthen us, Lord, so we will do what you would have us to do. And now, Lord, we want to lift up your people, especially those who are mourning the loss of so many loved ones, not just here in the United States of America, but around the world. Lord, we pray for our leaders who have gone, who has gone awry, not just in this country, but worldwide. And Lord, they have turned their backs upon the only source of salvation. But we believe and we know that soon and very soon, you will come, Lord, to take those who love you to a place where there will be no more sickness, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more suffering. And the enemy called death will eventually die. Lord, we want to lift up again some of your, your, your people here among us, especially your servant. Lord, we want to lift up your servant, Sister Britton, who will be going for surgery this week. We ask, Lord, that your hands will be upon the doctor's hands and the procedure will be flawless and she will have a testimony as to your goodness. We thank you for what you did to, for our dear uh, Brother Burke. Lord, we want to lift up also Sister Marva Taylor. We want to lift up also Sister Brian, Sister Ford, Sister Maturin, uh, Brother Harris. And Lord, we can continue with the names and go on and on, all the members in, 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 in uh, Emmanuel and uh, Mount Zion family and those who are reaching out even now on the internet for healing. Lord, those who don't have jobs or food to eat, we know, Lord, you have promised to provide for us. So we place our faith, our hopes in you, knowing, Lord, that we have a God who rained down manna from heaven. And today is no different for your children, Lord. We know how much you love the poor. And now, Lord, we lift up your humble servant, Pastor Meadows. We ask, O oh Lord, that you will fill him and grant him a double portion of your Holy Spirit even as he's presented our Sabbath school this morning with such clarity. We pray, Lord, now that you will give, let him 
present uh, your message with power and with conviction. And when we leave here today, may we say, it was good to have been in the house of the Lord. Bless us now, Lord, and keep us faithful until we hear the words from your lips saying, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. It is now time for our tithe and offering, and you know, I just, before I even do that, I neglected to wish our technology director, Mr. Desmond Hunter, happy birthday. You know, also, um, today is Sister Matherin's birthday also, and yesterday was Sister Esmeralda Hunt's birthday. These are all um, Christmas babies. So you know, the good thing about that is that you can give them all one gift, right? And on the 27th is Ian Watson's birthday. So we just want to wish each of them happy birthday. And as usual, I also want to thank you for your, 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 your consistent giving. We, you were very, very, um, that's what the word I'm, I'm looking for. You're very, very consistent, Mount Zion, and I'm sure Emmanuel, in your giving and very, very faithful. And We've, we've, we've been, you've seen us through 2020, and we pray as we go into 2021 that you will continue to be faithful and that we will be able to present programs for you, like we did last week um, when we had Best Believe, and I know we've had very good reviews of Best Believe, and we pray that we will continue to empower our young people so that they can present other programs for us. But now there are three ways to give, actually four. You can actually come here in person and uh, drop off your tithe and offering. Or you can actually mail it in to Mount Zion SDA Church, 2123 North Smith Street, Kissimmee, Florida, 34744. You can also do Cash App, which is um, dollar sign MT Zion SDA. Or you can go online to our website, mountzionsda.org and follow the prompt that says giving, online giving. So again, we thank you for your faithfulness, and we know that God will continue to bless you and all his people. Pray As we pray now for our offering, pray that God will continue to bless and keep each one of us. Father in heaven, we pray, Lord, for the offering that will be collected today, and not only here, but online. We pray, Lord, that it will go to further your work and hasten your coming. Lord, we're looking for your, your soon coming as we see the world is in a mess and we want to be extricated from this, this, um, this world. We pray, Lord, that you will be with the ones who had to give. Continue, Lord, to bless them abundantly. We pray for the ones who have not to give. That you will also bless them abundantly. And, Lord, we know that you will never... Uh, leave your people looking for bread or water or anything such. So, Lord, again, we thank you for your many, many blessings towards your people. In Jesus' name, amen.
our praise team comes, I just want to introduce our speaker for the hour to you. And if you watch Sabbath School this morning, you saw the wonderful job that Pastor Meadows did for Sabbath School. And um, he's going to be a speaker for Divine Worship. His topic today is going to be, where is Jesus and what is he doing now? Just to give you a little history of Pastor Meadows, um, he's a retired ordained pastor of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, president and CEO of Men on the Development and Go Ye Ministry. So those are things that we can check online and maybe there might be good information for our men's ministry. Uh, Meadows is Brooklyn-born and has a strong communication and motivational abilities that has taken him on a journey through North America, Canada, the Caribbean, Virgin Islands, Bermuda, England, and South Africa. He has served as a North American Division facilitator for Muslim ministries and a certified youth specialist for Michigan Department of Corrections and has a well-deserved reputation of accomplishments with the 11th District Court of Miami of, on domestic violence and the Berrien County Courts and Youth Recre Residential Detention Center, where he provided pretrial diversion programming and counseling. Now, I know Pastor Meadows doesn't want me to read all this stuff, but I will just tell you that um, he's also worked with um, Hartford Stop the Violence Initiative, and he's taught at uh, Hartford Community College and many others. So I just want to leave your account, his counsel to you. His counsel to you today is that every Christian will need a witness and worship identity. And he asks us all to stay on our toes, but keep your knees dirty. And I also want to mention that Sister Meadows is here with us today. Sister Meadows, good to have you. And after the praise team, the next voice you hear will be that of Pastor Nevalon J. Meadows. Please pray for him and give him your undivided attention. How many of you know that the strength that God gives us is like no other strength that we could obtain. There's no strength within us that we could use to be able to overcome the things that happen on a day-to-day -day basis or on a season-by-season -season basis, but I'm just so grateful for the strength that God gives us. Reach 
So we're going to start this song a little bit different this morning at the chorus.
nowhere. come this morning, Lord, gathered in the name of Jesus. We come to secure our position with you as a friend. We come to secure our position with you as one who believes in worship and who believes that you're worthy. We come asking, Lord, and acknowledging your continued presence. Bless us now. Simply so, just, just give us this day our daily bread. Just give us what we need today. We don't know what we'll need. We don't know what we'll encounter, but just give us what we need. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The eagle has a wingspan of eight feet. The eagle is able to hit his wings one time and go 15 miles. The eagle, it does not have any natural enemy other than man. For when the eagle encounters a hurricane, the eagle goes immediately to the eye and when the updraft of the warm wind would circle in the eye, the eagle would just float to the high and just ride in the eye of the storm. Jesus says, I'm going to bear you up, come on, on eagle's wings. So I don't know about you, but when I start looking around at what's happening, I ask myself this question, where is Jesus now? The eagle can fly 12 to 1,500, some say 2,000 feet in moving clouds. The eagle is able to see his prey from, from, from at least one mile, some even say two miles from its height. And, 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 and while it's flying high in the sky, the eagle is able to look down and see a trout in the moving river, or even see the scurrying rabbit. And the eagle is aware of the fact that he is as high as he is. And he knows that he cannot descend directly upon the prey because the prey is scurrying. And at that height, if he descends immediately down, the prey would get away. So the eagle is aware. He cannot come directly down, so he has to project his decline. Jesus projects. See, he knows the past, the present, and the future at the same time. He has something called omniscience. He doesn't depend upon memory because the memory is too slow. He automatically recalls. 
And so he saw the pandemic and he projects the blessing. And so I want to answer the question and have you to see the blessing. Where is Jesus now? Well, in order to understand that, we have to look at the 2300-day prophecy. And I just want to give you an overview because I don't believe many of us review this. I think we believe it's something that should come around only at the time of evangelism. Well, if you would, let me evangelize you. For the 23-day prophecy, it outlines a decree that it begins in 457 B.C. and concludes in 1844. And you can't answer completely where Jesus is and what he is doing if you don't understand the 23-day prophecy. And so, taking some look at our denominational development, some of us believe that we discovered the Sabbath all by ourselves. We failed to understand it was not only seven-day Baptist, but it was a, a woman that taught the seven-day Adventist church about the Sabbath. But it was the Millerites that led by a Baptist preacher, a Baptist preacher, a Baptist preacher. Some of us think that Adventists found the Advent message. No, it wasn't seven-day Adventists that found the seven-day Adventist message. It was Baptists and Methodists. And they studied, and William Miller was sure that what he was going to do was predict when Christ was to return. And, and somewhere in there, he did not follow the lead of the, of the Holy Spirit. As you can see in our denominational development, that out of the Millerite movement came other movements. There was a first day Adventist church. There was a movement that came out that says 1844 is the right date. It was a move and the right doctrine, but the wrong event. And out of that group, you'll find that we have the, the Church of God and also the Seventh-day Adventist Church. But there was another group that started on the same time of the Millerite movement. And they said 1844 was the wrong date. Uh, 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 and even uh, the event was wrong. And they went back to their churches. Another group came out and they kept setting dates saying, oh, he is coming the 25th. Oh, he is coming the 27th. Oh, he is coming in 1925. And when we look at the four phases of judgment, 1844 was the beginning of the investigative judgment. And he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be what? Be cleansed. And so there's a time when it begins and there's a time when it ends and it's called the 2300 day year of prophecy. But when does the 2300 day year prophecy begin? Well, Ezekiel 4 and verse 6. I know that I'm reviewing for most of you so I can hasten through this. Amen. After the number of the days in which ye searched the land, even 40 days, each day for a year. Whenever God says that something is going to happen, that's prophecy. And whenever God speaks in time, in terms of hours and day, it says each day for a year. Shall you bear your iniquities even 40 years? And ye shall know my breach of promise. And then here's the second verse in Ezekiel 4 and verse 6, the second point of argument. I have appointed thee each day for a year. Whenever we're dealing with time in prophecy, a prophetic day equals a literal year. So the 2,300-day year of prophecy is 2,300 years. And Daniel, in verse Daniel 9 and 25, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem. Now you have to understand that God's believing people were placed in a bondage and God's believing people had a prophecy set upon them and God said from the going forth of the commandment, not when they left, but when the king sent out an order, let them go back to Jerusalem. 
It says, therefore, from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah shall be seven weeks, three score, two weeks, and the street shall be built again and the wall. And this is the beginning of that time. Ezra says, and there went up some of the children, not when the then there went up some of the children and of the priests and the Levites and the singers and the porters and the Nethinims unto Jerusalem in the seventh year of Artaxerxes the king. So how do you know when this prophecy begins? Ezra 7 verse 7 tells you in the seventh year. Well, you can go to any Christian encyclopedia. You could even Google it, and it'll tell you King Artaxerxes, he started his kingdom in 464 B.C. Well, Ezra says in the seventh year. Well, you count down seven years, and if you're going B.C., you have to count backwards because B.C. counts backwards. Uh, 19, uh, 2020, 2021, those numbers go forward. B.C. goes backwards. So the first year of the king is 450, 464 B.C. to 463. That's one. Then you get from 458 B.C. to 457. That is the seventh year. So the seventh year is 457 B.C. That's how you know when to start counting. If you want to know and understand when Jesus was really born... Oh, Mary, did you know? Then you have to understand this prophecy. And one of the reasons why Jesus was born in a manger is because lazy folk wouldn't study prophecy. It was the magi, short for magicians and also those that believe in soothsaying. It was the magi that saw the star in prophecy. And when they saw it in the sky, they rehearsed it from memory and knew that it was the promised king. But the children of God did not study prophecy. So therefore, they were not prepared to receive him. Therefore, he was born in a manger because there were no Adventists. You don't understand that. See, an Adventist is one who looks at the Advent. The first Advent, he came as a baby. And he was born in a manger because there was no one to believe that he was no one that believed that he was coming as a baby. You don't understand the importance of being a seven day Adventist. Daniel 9, 24, seven weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. And so they're counting. I'm, I'm reviewing this for you to give you context. If this is new to you, it'll be made available to you through your church. So there are seven days in one week, and 70 times 7 is 490, which is 490 years. So seven weeks plus three score plus two is 69. Seven times 69 is 483 days. You count backwards. Yes, I'm going through this because I know you know it. Backwards from 483, and you will arrive 27 A.D. That's when Jesus was anointed as the Messiah. And then the last part of this, Daniel 9, 26, and after three score and two weeks shall the Messiah be cut off, die, but not for himself. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. What's one week? Seven days. Each day for a year, seven years. What's half of seven? Three and a half. How long did Jesus' ministry last? Three and a half years. And in the midst of the week, which means in the middle of seven, half seven, three and a half years, he shall be cut off. After three and a half years, he died. And so in the midst of the week, you'll find, right in the midst of the seven, you'll find that the seven's cut in half, so it's three and a half years. So you have when Jesus died. You have when he was the Messiah. You have when he was died. He died. And you have the season and you know the time of year. And so it's just a higher, a clearer or larger version of the same. The last seven days, which equals seven years. So the 200 day prophecy is an outline from 457 B.C. to 1844, which is the investigative judgment. So, 
walk with me. Noah preached for 120 years. And the first investigative judgment was when God had began at the Garden of Eden and then brought a responsibility and placed it on Noah to warn the people. And Noah preached 120 years. That was the first investigative judgment. What happened at the end of the 120 years? It rained. The second investigative judgment is 1844. Today, yes, it's right around the corner, so 2021. Today, year 2021, and the second investigative judgment continues. The investigative judgment is, go, is before God uh, brought the flood. He conducted an investigative judgment, and for 20, 120 years, Noah preached encouragement and warning to the people. So now, I want you to understand where we are right now. And as Seventh-day Adventists, you should be telling and teaching this. If you take 1844 away from 2021, you have 177 years. 2021 is right around the corner. I know it's 220, 2020, so I'm using 2021. But if you take 1844 from when the investigative judgment began, and then you look from 1844 to today, and we're using 2021, it's 177 years. If you see that, say amen. Noah preached how long? How long? 120. If you take 120 from 177, you have what? So the first investigative judgment, God allowed man 120 years. We're now going through the second investigative judgment. And we spent up 177 years, which means we're living right now on 57 years of grace. I'm trying to tell you where we are so you get perspective on what you should be saying. Where is Jesus now? So, right now, today, not only we're there with 57 years of grace, we're living in Revelation chapter 7, between verse 13 and 14. Oh, I'm not a know-it-all. But I tell you, that's what the word says. How do I know? Well, verse 12 and 13 already happened. Verse 14 has not happened. And they're both in Revelation chapter 6. Where are we right now? We're in Revelation chapter 6 between verse 13 and 14. Go a little bit further. You're concerned about the pandemic? You're concerned about whether or not we have I've been telling my friend, when you look at politics and you look at two sides of politics, there's only a good devil and a bad devil. And it doesn't matter which devil is in charge. You still got the devil. You're up there worrying about what one devil does and whether or not we get the other devil to replace that devil. Or you ain't listening to yourselves. We're living right now between verses 13 and 14. Verse 14, and the heaven departed as a scroll when it rolled together and every mountain was moved. Did every mountain move yet? No. Every island moved yet? No. And hid themselves and it said to the mountains and the rocks to fall on us. Probation will close soon. The events before probation are on the left side. The events after probation will be on the right side. Prophecy. Where are we? We're living in the time that is very specific in prophecy. And as seven-day Adventist Christians, an Adventist is a specialist, a specialist in the Advent. If you're not a specialist in the Advent, then you're not an Adventist. See, a machinist is a specialist 
in the machine. Come on, walk with me. There are four mysterious horsemen. We know the time in Revelation that's speaking of the sixth seal of verse 12. Revelation 12 and 13, the sixth seal was opened, a great earthquake. The sun became black, the moon became as blood, the stars of heaven fell unto the earth. Verse 14, every mountain, that has not happened. We're living right in the middle, the 21st century, right now, right today, we're living in the middle. We're right between verse 13 and verse 14. Revelation 6 and verse 12, and I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. November 1, 1755, Lisbon. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell on the earth. The falling stars, 1833. The day became dark, 1780. The moon is blood, 1780. These are events when you put them together by their observation. They're close in succession. They're close together, and they're prophesied in verses 14 and 17. They already happened. And not long ago. And as the heaven departed as a scroll, when it rolled together, every mountain and island were moved. And they cried out, hide us from the face of him, meaning that he came and they could not withstand the holiness of his presence. That has not happened. We're living between verse 13 and 14 in Revelation chapter 6. The seventh seal is open in chapter 8. And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of an hour. And I saw that seven angels stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. The national Sunday law is almost upon us. And I just want to prepare you for the things that you should know, the things you should be saying, and the position that you should obtain in teaching your family. This is an overview the close of probation will begin the seven last plagues. Today, right now, we're living during the investigative judgment. Just before the latter rain. The latter rain soon come. The ceiling includes the shaking. Revelation 7, it says, Hurt not the earth until I seal the saints in their heads, in their foreheads. That the ceiling includes the shaking. You look around and ask yourself, how many people have stopped professing? How many people have stopped participating in worship on the seven-day Sabbath? How many people the devil has punched in the gut and give them a sucker punch to have them confuse themselves, not even knowing what day is the Sabbath anymore? You know why? Because every seven-day Sabbath, those people are conditioned to just show up and they have no true worship and witness identity. They only go to church on Sabbath because of legalism. It's all a part of the shaking. There are four reasons why there's a shaking and it's a shaking in the Christian church but yet and still a shaking in the Seventh-day Adventist church. Religious indifference. Now, I don't know how much time I have, but you let me know when my time is running out. If he doesn't give me a signal, I'm not going to pay attention. There are four reasons for the shaking in the Laodicean church. Who's the Laodicean church? You are. I am. Second volume, Selected Messages, page 166. For the, the, the message of the Laodiceans goes to every professed seven-day Adventist who have received much light but did not walk in it. We are the Laodicean church. When you read Revelation chapter 3 and you'll find a description of the Laodicean church, it says they're neither hot nor cold. Indifferent. I don't care if I go to church or not. Indifferent. I don't care if I do ministry or not. Indifferent. Lukewarmness. The second reason why, because of persecution. When persecution comes and people are asked what day you worship on and they're silent, they're saying yes to anything the accuser says. The third, rejection of the legacy and message. Fourth, 
superficial knowledge. There are so many black seven-day Adventists, men, who are being swept away by black Israelites because we don't study our message to teach them how to defend and take position on our message. So then you got all the upheaval, political upheaval about social injustice, and you got black millennial males without identity. Add to that the absence of their father. Add to that the absence of a spiritual home. See, Jesus had a good home, but Jesus didn't have a Christian home. I'll enjoy that one by myself. And the Lord said to Simon, Behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that ye may, he may sift you as wheat. For lo, I will, I will command and I will sift the house of Israel among all nations. So there's going to be a sifting. There's going to be a shaking. Sifting, yes, is panning for gold. But the separation of wheat from the tear is sifting. The separation of wheat from the tares, identifying God, identifying the good portions for himself. But the devil also sifts. Shaking is always done upside down. What takes place before the close of probation is shaking and sifting. COVID-19 is one of the instruments of shaking and sifting. And we're not been able to salvage the pew. And in some cases, we can't even salvage the pulpit. Maybe the pulpit is too far from the pew. Maybe the pew was too far from the pulpit. And this word, yet once more, signified the removing of those things that are shaken as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. We serve a God with a multifaceted understanding and practice of love. There is victory in the promises, and we shared that with you. Jesus loves reflects his love. That's multifaceted jewel of love. For God, the greatest lover, so loved the greatest degree, the world that he gave, the greatest company that he gave, the greatest act, his only son, the greatest gift, whosoever, the greatest opportunity, believeth the greatest simplicity in him, the greatest attraction, not perish, the greatest promise, but the greatest difference, have the greatest certainty, certainty, everlasting life, the greatest possession. The Adventist message, he came and he died. Jesus really did die. Second part of our message, he's coming again. The closer we get to Jesus, the more we can see. The closer we get to Jesus, the more we can see. The investigative judgment takes place in the courts of heaven. There's a specified time, and it's fixed for the investigative judgment. Great controversy. 548. Only one question is asked. You're only asked one question. Have they been obedient to my commandments? The cleansing of the sanctuary involves the work of the investigative judgment because the sanctuary cannot be cleansed unless there's an investigation. Well, who's been obedient? There must be an investigation. So there cannot be a cleansing. There cannot be a removing of our history of sin unless God investigates us. Investigative judgment closes with the living. Every man works closely previewed by God during the investigative judgment. Judgment must begin where? Where? At the house of God. The investigative judgment began with people who first lived on earth. Great controversy. 483. The investigative judgment began with Adam. When God asked Adam, where art thou? God was not asking Adam about his geographical location. See, God is everywhere. So God knew where Adam was. God was not asking Adam, are you in the northern 
or the southern or the eastern portion of the garden. God was not asking Adam about his geographical location. God was asking Adam about his position on sin. Where art thou? What's your position on sin? Well, well, well Lord, I, I, I'm with him. I, I, I heard your voice. I, I, I was naked, and I, I, I hid myself. Investigative judgment. The first investigative judgment continues for 120 years. Noah builds the ark. God destroys the world by water. And there is today a specific message for these times. The enemy used this term, present truth, to run seven-day Adventists away from biblical principle. Because every time we hear present truth, We think there's some extreme shepherd rod somewhere. Say amen. Amen. Present truth is a biblical doctrine. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them, and be established. Where? Where? In present truth. And in order for the enemy to get you to turn away from present truth, he gives opportunity to his agreeing flock to use present truth in a negative way. So that when the saints of God hear present truth, we turn away from it, not knowing that present truth are the things that are present that we need to know. Where's Jesus now? That's present truth. Present truth demands that we know where he is and what he is doing. There's precious truth. There are three truths. There's precious truth. He died for me. There's promised truth. He's coming back again. There's present truth. Whatever he is doing right now is present truth. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things and be established in what? In present truth. Present truth is the current ministry of Christ. Present truth is the current ministry of the remnant church. That's you. Present truth is the current fulfillment of prophecy. Noah had present truth in his day. Noah said, get in the boat. Everybody, get in the boat. That was present truth. For Noah's day. Jonah had present truth. Obey God. Go to Nona, Go to Nineveh. But don't go near that water. There's a big fish in it. Present truth for his day. Elijah had present truth for his day. If God be God, serve him. That was present truth for his day. John the Baptist had present truth. Get in the water. We're shutting down this Jewish synagogue. Get in the water. Be baptized in Jesus Christ. Get in the water. You notice how all of these have some kind of contact or association with water. Jesus had present truth in his day. Get out of that church and get in me. That was his message. That was present truth. For his day. And the enemy, the devil, uses present truth to keep you away from what you need to know. We have present truth. It's decision time. It's the three angels' message. It says, worship him. And it says, if any man worship the beast and his image shall receive the mark. The three angels' message is God's last warning to the world. Present truth demands that we know what Jesus is doing now. I saw the necessity of messengers reading the yellow. Satan is pressing in on every side. And unless we watch for him and have our eyes open to his devices, there are many precious truths contained in the word of God. But present truth is what Mount Zion needs. Present truth is what Mount Zion needs. But the subjects of the sanctuary, she gives four categories. What should we be teaching? What should we be studying? 
the category, sanctuary, 2,300 days, the commandments of God, and faith of Jesus, which is spirit of prophecy. And the first thing the devil does is to take away your ability to see. And the church is angry with Ellen White, angry with Ellen White's writings, angry with anyone that quotes it. Why can't you just use the Bible? Well, if I use it, the Bible will tell you about the faith of Jesus. When we get some time, ask the question, and I'll send the information. We've gone through the, we're going through the investigative judgment. Whether you know it or not, we've experienced a false revival since 1999 in that area. Stomp. What you doing? Stomp. Anybody know? Stomp. Little shorty sing the song. Stomp. When we got rid of that guy, that guy no longer, we no longer have a, we got rid of that person. And then we brought in the praise team, and there's nothing wrong with praise. Nothing wrong with praise. But we went too far. That was the same time we had issues about drums. Ellen White was never against drums. But we fought, and then finally, all of Christianity got drums. All of Christianity got a praise team. That was not the issue. The issue was whether or not you thought you were closer to God because of your praise. We went through the false revival. Revival and Reformation. Anybody studied the Sabbath school lesson, remember 2012 when the GC president called for revival and reformation and he put out a Sabbath school quarterly entitled Revival and Reformation. The only time in my life since Thanksgiving Day 1979 have I ever seen a Sabbath school quarterly entitled Revival and Reformation. He gave an official call at a GC meeting. You should know this. The shifting and shaking and sifting is going on. We get some time. We need to talk about the prayer of primitive godliness. These are things that we should know. Adventists believes in the coming of Jesus. But you're not the only Adventist. So stop being arrogant. They're Baptist Adventists. They're Catholic Adventists. Lutheran, Methodist, Presbyterian, even Jewish Adventists. What's an Adventist? One who believes in the advent of Jesus Christ. You're a specialist in the business matters of Jesus. I used to tell the folk, you're a non-canonical, proclatory prophet of the second coming. Huh? This is your new title for 2021. I'm bestowing it upon you. You're a non-canonical, proclatory prophet of the second coming. How are you going to say that you're a Christian and you don't talk about the coming of Jesus? If you talk about the coming of Jesus, then you're prophesying. But do you have any books in the Bible? No, that's why you're non-canonical. Anything that's in the Bible is called canonical. If you don't have any books in the Bible, then you're non-canonical. So you're a non-canonical, proclamatory prophet of the second coming. You got a new title, even if you're unemployed. The second coming is about deliverance. The second coming is not about salvation. Stop telling your children you'll be saved when Jesus comes. That's a lie. You got to be saved before he comes. He that is unjust, be unjust still. He that is filthy, the Lord said, hold, I got my, I come quickly and my reward where? Is with me. I'm not giving you a second chance at the second coming. There's no second chance at the second coming. What I'm about to say now is only for seven-day Adventists. You're not a seven-day Adventist if you don't believe what I'm about to say right now. Mind you, you don't have to be a seven-day Adventist to be saved. Amen? Amen. But you got to worship where you agree, and God's going to hold you responsible for what you know. So you can say, the preacher said, I don't have to be 
Seventh-day Adventist to be saved. I'm going to stop being a Seventh-day Adventist. Well, you already been exposed to something. There's the remnant church and there's the remnant body. The remnant church is a Seventh-day Adventist church. The remnant body are the sheep I have that are not of this fold. That's the large, broad body. There's a remnant body and there is a remnant church. These are the four things that describe the remnant church. If you don't believe these four things, then you're not a Seventh-day Adventist. And mind you, you don't have to be a Seventh-day Adventist to be saved. The Seventh-day Adventist church is a church that cannot exist until 1798. Why? Because Catholicism ruled the world until 1798. If a church come into existence before 1798, and in some way it will be attached to Catholicism. The second point, the Seventh-day Adventist church believes in practicing all ten commandments with emphasis on the fourth commandment. The third point, the Seventh-day Adventist church has a worldwide message, three angels' message. If you don't believe in the three angels' message and the other two, you are not, as well as number four. It is a church that believes in all the writings of spirit of prophecy. It's okay to be an Adventist, but to be a seven-day Adventist, you have to accept all four. Where is Jesus now? This is for you to take a breath. Where is Jesus now? Well, we have a high priest. Seeing then that we have a high priest that is passed into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Remember, at the end of the 2,300 years, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. And the sanctuary was not on earth. That's why he didn't come to earth. The sanctuary was in heaven. So how was the sanctuary in heaven clean if we didn't have a priest? So Jesus ascends as our priest and then go through the installation service and becomes a high priest. Hebrews 5, so also Christ glorified not himself to be made a high priest. But he said unto him, thou art my son, today have I gotten thee. Let them build me a sanctuary, why? That I might dwell with them. And the sanctuary has four covers, and the four covers... The, uh, uh, as you come from the outside to the inside, it's like seeing a badger skin on the outside, and you get closer. In other words, the closer you get to Christ, the more attractive he is. The closer you get to the sanctuary, understanding you're going from the outer to the inner, to the inner, to the inner, till you get close, that you see the more attractive he is. So the sanctuary is something we need to at least understand. The sanctuary was given to the children of Israel. Well, when they came out of Egypt, they came from training of rising in the morning and facing the sun. What God did was he built his throne, the most holy place in the west. So now when they get up, they have to face west and turn their back on the false God. God knew what he was doing when he gave them the Ten Commandments and gave them the instructions for the sanctuary. Jesus on earth is called the courtyard. It's where he cleansed me. He died for me. His earthly ministry he died for me, and that's how I got cleansed. The sanctuary demonstrates that in the altar and the labor. The labor is for cleaning. There's seven pieces of furniture. And Jesus began his ministry in heaven, in the holy place. On earth, you had the altar of burnt offering, which is the cross he died, and labor was the cleansing that the power he brings of mercy. The seven pieces of furniture, you'll find that there are those that are inside the most holy, the holy place. The courtyard has two pieces of furniture. The holy place has three pieces of furniture. And the most holy place has two. 
And so you have the curtain of, of, of angels and the goat's hair and ram's covering and four badges, the badges. These four, because four represents the things of earth. There are four gospels. There are four angels that have four wings, that have four faces, that can go in four directions without turning. And so you find the four colors of the sanctuary are symbolic of what each gospel said about Jesus. I know we're dropping it on you. I know you heavy cogitating. But this used to be the level of all seven-day Adventist instruction. But you required the preachers to do something different. Make me feel a certain way. Preach to me a certain way. Tell me what makes me feel good. Well, I'm not here to be your friend. I'll establish truth, and after I establish truth, if you want to be my friend, be my friend. And our children, we need to bring them in line. Because the first thing the devil's going to do is attack the church through the children. And they put laws in place that some of you are afraid to even talk to your children. Are we taking note? Pause. So the brazen altar represents the cross of Calvary. The labor is where the cleansing takes place. In the most holy place, you'll find pieces of furniture and as well in the holy place. Where is Jesus? Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. Well, how is that place prepared? Well, he has to bring his sacrifice to the holy place. It's accepted, and he moves to the cleansing in the most holy place. It's not just because he died. He has to do something with the sacrifice that he made. So neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained what? Eternal life for us. So he had to enter into the holy place. Jesus began his ministry in heaven in the holy place where there are these three pieces of furniture. And for the light, the candle, the light, the seven branches candlestick represents Jesus' light of the world. The oil represents the Holy Spirit. Mind you now, this golden piece was five to six feet tall. It was never cut. It was beaten with a hammer. Beaten and bruised. The altar of incense represents the prayer of God's people. So you find them situated in the sanctuary, and when you look at them, they all lined up to make a cross. There's the most holy place and the holy place, and in the most holy place, you'll find that there is the ark as well as the mercy seat. And the mercy seat are not the two angels. The mercy seat is what the angels are on setting on top of. And the ark is the box that's only in the most holy place. It's called the ark of the covenant. They have one wing up to salute and one wing down in humility. It's a place not made with hands. Now, God's law is inside the ark. Moses' law is on the outside of the ark. There are those of us who believe that Moses' law and God's law is the same. They're not the same. For Moses wrote on tablets, on, on paper. All right? Colossians 2, verse 14, blotting out the handwriting, the handwriting, nailing it to the cross. Second Chronicles 33, the whole law and the statutes and the ordinances by the hand of Moses. Moses wrote with his hand. God wrote on stone with his finger. And God's law is inside the ark to say that it's permanent. Moses' law is on the outside the ark to say that it's temporary. Deuteronomy 31, 26 and Exodus 40 and verse 20. The ark had the manner of gold and the Ten Commandments and Aaron's rod that budded and the, only the high priest, priest was allowed to enter the most holy place. Wherefore, in all things, it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be merciful and faithful high priest. 
Jesus could not become a high priest without the witness of his brethren. There were graves that was open when he resurrected, and it was two from every nation and representing of the priesthood. Hebrews 4, for we have not a high priest, which cannot, and a double not means yes, be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but at all points was tempted like as we are. It is finished. I am perfect in Christ while being perfected by Christ. Mind you, we hear it and we have issues with it. How are you going to say Jesus is your redeemer and you ask him to forgive you of all sin, but you don't believe all your sin is covered? If you have all your sins covered, then you're perfect in Christ. The Bible didn't ask you, do you feel like being perfect? The Bible commands us, be ye therefore perfect. And so it is finished, has taken place on the cross. The last sacrifice ended the need for the earthly sanctuary. Now at that feast, Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. And the veil of the temple between the holy place and the most holy place was as thick as some say as two or three telephone books. And it was torn from the top to the bottom. And it stood at least seven to ten feet high. You tell me who could jump up there, stay up there long enough, and rip three telephone books. It's an indication that God ended this from the top to the bottom from heaven. There is one God, one mediator between God and men, and that man is Jesus Christ. It is finished. There are no more sacrifices required. That's what it means. It is finished. The veil of the earthly temple is rent, torn, and the end of a ceremonial system. It is finished, the ceremonial law. You don't have to carry a sheep or a goat when you come to church. That system is finished. But what is the difference between it is finished and it is done? And the seventh angel poured out his veil, vial into the air. And there came a great voice out of the temple, out of the temple. Who's in the temple? Jesus, what is he doing? He's the high priest. And a great voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne. From the, who's sitting on, who's, who? Jesus. It's saying what? It is done. Jesus is in the temple, our intercessor, our advocate, our propitiation. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no man, meaning no man's record. And no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were ended. It is finished. The sacrifice is made once. The sacrifice of atonement is required to be made once and presented once. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place. Once. But didn't Jesus promise to be with us always? With us always doesn't mean forgive us always. Intercession must stop. In other words, people of God, there's going to come a time when there'll be no intercessor. There's going to come a time when you're going to feel that there is no point or direction for your prayers. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe what? All things. Whatever I taught you, whatever I gave you, whatever instruction God has given you, God is holding you responsible for teaching and giving it to everyone. You can't wait for the elders to do it after you've learned it. You can't wait for the pastors to do it after you've been taught it. 
You can't wait for annual evangelism after you sat in Sabbath school and you know it. So, and lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Watch this. Jesus surrenders his omnipresence. Right? He's in one place at one time. I should say the Son of God becomes Jesus, fully God and fully man, and he surrenders his omnipresence. He decides he's going to wear this flesh, and because he's wearing flesh, he's restricted by time and space. The Holy Spirit is given. The Holy Spirit is the another comforter. In order for there to be an another comforter, there had to be a other comforter. Come on, saints of God. Come on, come on, walk with me. So since there was an another comforter, uh, there had to be an other comforter. Therefore, the other comforter was the first, and the other was not the another because the another was the second. The Holy Spirit is the another comforter, and he leads and guides. He seals and confirms. The Holy Spirit is given as the early rain and soon the latter rain. Jesus never leaves and is a presence through the Holy Spirit. That's how he keeps his promise. With us always doesn't mean he'll forgive us always. For some of us believe that we can commit sin until the clouds crack. As our high priest, as our substitute, but he is no longer our sacrifice. Mama used to say this. Mama was born in a place called Edgefield, South Carolina. And, and Mama used to be on the radio before the Long Ranger came on the radio. Mama be singing. And Mama used to say, God will take off his doggone and put on his confound. There's a time when God is going to stop comforting and God is going to penalize. He's going to punish. He's going to judge. So you cannot have God judging the earth. Come on, look at me. You can't have God punishing man and at the same time hugging man because you can't hug somebody and hit them at the same time. So God has to take away the hug. God's got to take away the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit methodically, slowly, is being removed from this planet. And only those of us who are in right relationship with the Lord, understanding what it is that we are and need to do, will that communication of the latter rain be given. God keeps his promise. He removes the comforter and becomes the judge. Sacrifice must end. Jesus is not on the cross. Intercession must end. Jesus as our substitute. The executive judgment must begin, which is the wrath of God. Don't be troubled by what you see or what you hear. It doesn't get better. There are five phases of judgment as we move to close. I'll just make sure they get on the screen and deal with those typos later. And I saw thrones and they that sat upon them and judgment was given unto them. And the judgment of execution of sentence. There's an execution of sentence when God actually sends out Fire. Fire came down from God out of where? Is hell fire beneath our feet? No. Fire comes down from, from heaven. If somebody tells you that uh, there's hell on earth, they're not talking about the fire that comes down from heaven. When that fire comes down from heaven, that's the executive judgment. And they gather around the city in Revelation 20 in verse 9, and they're consumed with fire. That's the lake of fire. Intercession must stop where God says, I forgive you. 
investigative judgment must stop so there can be fire. No second chance at the second coming. After their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. What does that mean? As long as you remit your sin, there needs to be no offering for your sin. Hebrews 10, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. How can that be? Well, once their life record is reviewed, God remembers them no more. Once you have gone through the judgment, you don't have to go through the judgment anymore. You don't know when you'll be judged. But you must prepare. It is done means probation is closed. And the vials, seven vials. I like that. It's done. This is the time for the prayer of primitive godliness. If you want to study that, Jeremiah 30 and verse 7. Alas, for that, verse 6, ask ye now and see whether a man doth travail with child. You ever see a man pregnant with a baby? No. But there's going to come a time when men are going to be in so much pain that look like men are pregnant, men, women, children. And the pain and the suffering, alas, for that day is great so that none is like it. It is even the time of what? Jacob's trouble. But he shall what? Be saved out of it. Jacob's trouble takes place when there is no intercessor. Read the story of Jacob. How can Jesus wrestle with Jacob? And Jesus represents the comfort in God, and that comfort in God is wrestling with Jacob. It's a application for us to understand that our intercessor, our comforter, will be no more. There's a time there will be no more. And we'll be in the same situation as Jacob. And all we will have is our relationship. So, but he shall be saved out of it. Man is without a mediator in the sanctuary in heaven. Why? Because mediation has to stop. But he shall be saved out of it. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that do the commandments of God. I'm going to pray with you, but I just want you to consider that now, while we have a time to use the internet without locks and control. You see it coming. Controlling Facebook, controlling Twitter. Now while we have a time to do the gospel, we should be using social media. We should be using internet. And for those of us that don't know it, use your two fingers and figure it out. For God has put the church on shutdown with a focus in front of us. And that focus is to keep the message in front of the world. So now we have time for prayer. Psalms 88 and verse 13 as we close. In the morning will my prayer prevent thee. This is Psalms 88 and verse 13. So when I'm telling you the Keep your knees dirty. I'm, I'm, talking about, I'm talking about prayer. Psalms 88 and verse 13 tells you about the power of prayer. You find that, that, that David says, in the morning, that means early before activity, in the morning will my prayer prevent you. In other words, I'm going to pray. And I know that you're God, that you're everywhere at the same time. I know that you're omnipresent, always going where you're coming from to get to where you is, to find out you're already there. I know that you're omnipresent, but in the morning when I pray, my prayer is going to find its way around you. And my prayer is going to get in front of you. That's what David is saying. And David is saying that when, 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 when I, my prayer gets in front of you, it's going to prevent you because of my faith. 
See, we're talking about prayer in these days while we have someone listening. And David says, in the morning, will my prayer prevent you? In other words, my prayer will forestall you. My prayer will get to where you're going. Remember now, God's omnipresent. My prayer will get to where you're going. Get there before you get there and stop you. That's prayer. That's what God has given us now. It's not going to last long. Because there come a time when there'll be no intercessor. Lastly, three things, four things I want to tell you about prayer. Every time we pray, it describes a holy relationship. Every time we pray, it takes us on holy ground. It doesn't matter what trouble, a car accident, social injustice, bill and home conflict. Every time you pray, it removes you from that situation and places you in a holy presence and a holy relationship. Number three, prayer is not for God. Come on, saints of God. Some of us think that when we pray, especially our young people don't understand, when you're praying, you're not uploading information. When you pray, you're not downloading anything either. When you pray, prayer is not for God. Number four, prayer is for you. Prayer is getting in front of God. Prayer is telling God that one thing that I understand when I talk to you is therapeutic. Prayer is therapeutic. Prayer is preparatory. But after you talk to God in prayer, talk to God about prayer, now you're prepared to receive the blessing. So prayer. In Matthew 17 and verse 21. How be it this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. I don't know if you're concerned about this president or the one to come, or the one four years from now. But I want you to understand that when you began to look at the enemy and not look at the solution, then you're giving too much attention to the enemy. For there hasn't been no temptation that has taken you that such as is common to God. But in Matthew 17, and verse 21, how be it this kind, this kind of what, this kind of demon goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. If you don't have a prayer and fasting chain in your home, get one in your church. If you don't have a prayer and fasting chain in your church, then get one on your job. If you don't have a prayer and fasting chain in your job, get one at school. But when you pray and you fast, praying is talking to God. Fasting is not dieting. Fasting is dying. Lord, I'd rather die than for you not to answer this prayer. That God reads your intentions and God moves according to your intentions. And the reason why some of us don't have our prayers answered, because of the friends we have. God can't bless you because of the people you choose to be around. Because if they see you being blessed, it will cause them to stumble. But since you chose them, God has to move them and bless them or prepare them for your blessing. But how be it this kind, this kind of what? This kind of demon goeth not out unless you pray and fast. Our Father and our God. For we, want, we understand the health message. We understand what it is to live according to this message. We understand what it is to live according to the outline of health in your word. We understand what it is to pray. We understand what it is to fast. But Lord, we're asking that you would put on our hearts the clarity that is needed for us to be consistent. 
We're in the battle. We're in warfare. Sometimes the battle is within the home. Sometimes the battle, Lord, is just within our own hearts. We're in a battle. And we're struggling with whether to get right so, and whether to do right. We're struggling, Lord, so that we can serve you in a way that we have not served you. And we're struggling and all our focus seems to be is on the outside of our trouble. And on the outside of the trouble is the one causing the problem while inside you're the solution. And you're telling us that you have a way out. Give us the clarity of mind and of heart. And before we close, I'd just like to ask if you're here today or if you are available through social media, if you're streaming online, that you might ask God to do three things for you in your prayer. To ask for peace. To give our young people time to establish a relationship with him. To ask for peace. To give our old people time to be the correct example for our young people. To ask for peace. To give leadership of the church time to communicate the message that we need to have. If that's your prayer, I just want you to stand with me. And if you're online and you're looking, and if you're online and you're taking note, just wave your hand across. If you stand, it's a testimony to your faith, not me, not mine. Lord, I'm praying for the peace. But I want to see and understand and take hold. Forgive me, Lord, of my sin and save me from Satan and save me from sin and save me from myself in Jesus name may God bless you and may God give you what you need please be seated God's blessings on you thank you Mount Zion family God bless you the Lord, praise the Lord. We want to thank you for joining us here at Mount Zion. We want to just remind you on the last Sabbath of this year that you are loved and there is nothing that you can do about it. Let's end out with Lord, you are good and your mercy endures forever.